Ooh, our boy Bucky strikes again. And I ain't talking about the Winter Soldier. Yeah, this feels like a dream. YouTube team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video. And in this video, Bucky Brooks is back. And he has compiled a list of QB coach duos that are under the most pressure in 2021. But before we get into this list and see if he's right or he may be wrong, and we'll go from there. But I got to tell y'all, be good to yourself. Be good to yourself because I know we always talk about how you should be looking out for other people, which is good. How you should be reaching out to other people, which is great. How you should be thinking of other people, which is nice. But you also got to take care of yourself. Take time to step back from whatever it is that you do on a normal basis and just, just breathe. Take a breather. Straight up. Whether things are good, whether things are bad, take a breather. We all need it. We all need that break. We all need that time off. It's super important, and it, it keeps you sane, too. Uh, but anyway, somebody who a lot of y'all think is a little bit insane is Mr. Bucky Brooks. But let's see what he has to say, and let's see what this list consists of and how he came to the point that he did. Anyway, it says, There's nothing like the pressure of expectations in the NFL. The Super Bowl or bust mentality that permeates the league routinely puts head coaches and quarterbacks squarely on the hot seat heading into the regular season okay okay we see where we're going uh this year the offseason quarterback carousel has raised expectations for several franchises around the league with the qb1 and the head coach shouldering the responsibility for the team's performance fair or not these tandems will face consequences if their teams fail to deliver when it matters given some time to survey the landscape here are the five quarterback Head coach combos facing the most pressure heading into the season all right so now we see where Bucky Brooks is going with it because he said, fair or not. So whether you think it's fair or not, whether you think it's right or wrong, these tandems will face consequences if their teams fail to deliver when it matters. <laughs> Let's get into the list. Number one. The Los Angeles Rams. It's Super Bowl a buzz for the Rams after they shipped out Jared Goff as part of the deal with the Lions for Stafford. With Goff's 42-20 and 20 record and a Super Bowl appearance in four seasons under McVay representing the bar, the pressure is squarely on the shoulders of Stafford and McVay to capture the Lombardi Trophy. Considering the 13-year pro has zero playoff wins and only four winning seasons in his resume, the Rams quarterback shuffle is a roll of the dice that could backfire on a team looking to make good on his current competitive window. So, okay, um, with Matt Stafford and the Rams, they, they got a squad now. They, they have a squad on offense, on defense. Those boys, they got a squad, man. They got a nice little team over there. Uh, is there pressure on them? Yeah, there is, but at the same time, I feel like the Jared Goff move, that was just a way to get that contract out of here. It was a way to get that contract. Now, they did give up some stuff for, for Matt Stafford. So, you know what, there is um there is this, sort of that sense of pressure like, okay, we got to make this thing work. Okay, we got to make this thing happen. But as far as consequences, oh, could there really be consequences like that for Sean McVay? Or well, Matt Stafford, if it doesn't work out, for Sean McVay, I just don't see. You never know. It would have to absolutely, for Sean McVay to be up out of there, it would have to absolutely fail, crumble to the ground. It would just have to be a terrible, a terrible, terrible ending for their season. Like where they don't even sniff the playoffs and they know well in advance that they ain't making the playoffs. But anyway, that that's number one. That's who he says the, the QB and coach duo that faces the most pressure, 
going into this season. He says it's them. Number two, who I'm sure a lot of y'all will be interested in, the Baltimore Ravens. All right, Bucky, let's see what you got to say. Lamar Jackson has posted a 30-7 and career regular season record and claimed an MVP award in 2019 while dazzling as an electric dual-threat playmaker. But... Questions persist about his pocket passing ability after observers watch the Ravens run heavy offense fizzle in three straight early playoff exits. So three straight early playoff exits. Well, early. Uh, well, the first year. Yeah, they 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 got into uh, they won their division. So they had the home playoff game. Um, Lamar's rookie season. Uh, and they lost. They lost. They started to come back at the end, but it, it just wasn't enough. Second time, they skipped the wild card. They said, oh, no, we, we ain't doing wild card. We, we better than that. We ain't doing a wild card. Let's, let's skip that. So they skipped the wild card because they went 14-2. and two. Uh, And, and then on their, in their first playoff game um, that year, they got beat up on by the Titans. So then following that, this year, they played the Titans in, that was the wild card game, I believe. They played the Titans in the wild card. Uh, and this time, they weren't at the crib. They were the visiting team. And then they won, and then they lost in the divisional round to the Buffalo Bills. So, I mean, depending on how you look at it, that's, it's not even an early playoff exit. Now, if you're going by as soon as they got in, like they like that uh, Homer Simpson dad, that, that gif where he walks into the ball, takes off his hat, picks up his hat, and walks right out. That's how it was with the Ravens in the first two playoff games. But anyway... Back to it. He said, with Jackson and company underperforming in the postseason, the pressure is mounting on Harbaugh to diversify the offense to give the Ravens a better chance of advancing in the tournament. Okay. I, I don't think, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, will the Super Bowl winning head coach stick to the unorthodox script that has made the Ravens perennial title contenders in the Jackson era? Or will he scrap the plan in favor of a traditional approach that could produce better results in the postseason the outcome of the decision could make or break the ravens next few seasons okay interesting it could it could make or break the ravens next few seasons ah the the last part like okay so i'm um, overall this whole thing there's some stuff that i'm with okay i agree and there's some stuff where i'm like i don't know about all that part but let's let's just go Peace by peace. All right. So we already talked about the playoff part with Jackson and company underperforming in the postseason, which they have been. We, we can all acknowledge that, honestly. So we know that. So with them underperforming in the postseason, the pressure is mounting on Harbaugh to diversify the offense to give the Ravens a better chance of advancing in the tournament. That part, we, I think we all agree with that. I, I don't think there's going to be one Ravens fan that's like, hey, what the Ravens have been doing in the playoffs is good enough. No, it's obviously not. Because you see them during a the regular season, and it they'll be like this powerhouse team. They walking all over defenders and all that. They beating people up. They bullying people. But then the playoffs come, and it's, it's a whole nother animal. It's a whole different story. Whole different story. And one of the biggest problems that we see in the playoffs is that it's been a couple of different things. Sometimes it's that the Ravens, they end up, you know what, let's not be ourselves. We, we're going to try to be somebody else. That was certainly in 2019. Run heavy team, led the league in rushing by far. But 2019, they were like, you know what, you know what, let's go back to 2018. Before you even touch on 2000, let's go back to 2018. And this has been my thing with the Ravens. Uh, my, one of my biggest problems with the Ravens um, since 2018. 2018, obviously, Lamar first came on the scene, took the league by storm with that crazy running game, and it was just like, oh, my goodness, this, this is wild. So then um, we knew that, hey, and we played the Chargers two times in, I think, three weeks. So the Ravens made the playoffs, and the, the running game was their bread and butter. That's how they got in the playoffs. They did pass the ball, too, but it was mainly that running game. That was the strongest part of their game. So they got there, got to the playoffs. That running game got put on hold. They didn't have a plan B. They did not have a plan B. And the way that they stuck to the running game, it, it was just after the first quarter, it's like, okay, 
All right, I see why you're still sticking with it. Second quarter, okay, I still give you, give you, I give you a pass. But then third quarter and even fourth quarter, they were still like, you know, uh, this ain't working. Where's our plan B? They didn't have one. They did not have a plan B. So they they failed to prepare. In my eyes, it was just it was poor preparation. So then 2018, I mean 2019, excuse me, the following year, 14 and two, just killing the league. They get to the playoffs. And they go straight to plan B. And it's like, like whoa, 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 plan A is working so great during the regular season. Yeah, you want to switch it up. You don't want to be predictable. But at, at the same time, like, why are we not trying plan A first? Why don't we just scrap plan A completely and go straight to plan B? Like between Gus Edwards and, and Mark Ingram. And again, Mark Ingram was hurt, but you still wanted to try to force it to him. But hey. Why, why were we not relying more on Gus Edwards? Why did Gus Edwards only run the ball, I think, what, three times? And, uh, it was just like, what? And then, of course, I mean, you throw in a lot of drops here and there. I mean, you, could, you can go back to 2018, too, with the drops. And then 2019 with the drops. But then in 2020, in 2020, uh, they, obviously, the first game, they, they started off a little slow and against the Titans. They started off slow. Uh, but they they rebounded. It was just little things here and there that they just needed to fix, and they fixed them. Um, and they they came back and won. Killed a lot of narratives that game too. But then against the Bills, Bills Bills were stopping that run game. They were stopping that run game. Uh, and then in, in, with the passing game, just nothing was shaking. There there was some drops, <laughs> but again, I think the biggest one. Oh, the offensive line was a big yikes too. But one of the things that stuck out to me. Um, especially in 2019 and 2020 in those playoff games, uh, was Hollywood Brown. And he, he cannot be the only one. He can't be the only one. Hollywood in the playoffs, oh, man. I wish they would use Hollywood in a regular season how they use him in the playoffs, too. Because in, play, in the playoffs, they like, it's like they save, they save all these crazy Hollywood plays just for playoffs. He be going over playoffs, man. They be having them move around. They be having them in the backfield. They be having them on all these different routes. And it's like, oh, my God, it's so pretty. But in the regular season, they say, all right, Hollywood, go route. Let's do it. All right, go route. Go, go. All right, nine route. Go. All right, just fly. Go. And that's it. That's it. But in the playoffs, oh, boy, they be using, they be using, using him. We know he's been in Ravens number one wide receiver, but in the playoffs, like they really use him like a number one wide receiver. They use that boy Hollywood, man. But again, last year in the Bills game, it was a reminder that he shouldn't be the only one. And not only that, but you gotta find ways to use other guys too. You got to. It's very, very important that you do that. So, moving on. Uh, when it says, will the Super Bowl winning head coach stick to the unorthodox script that has made the Ravens perennial title contenders in the Jackson era? Or will he scrap the plan in favor of a traditional approach that could produce better results in the postseason? Now, I don't think you need to certainly I don't think you need to scrap what you've done to get you this far. I don't think you need to scrap it, but you need to make some adjustments here and some adjustments there, mainly in a passing game. To really get the most out of your receivers, get the most out of Lamar Jackson, really get the most out of this offense. Because the run game, the run game is there. We know the run game is there. Run game is amazing. But the passing off the passing offense is where the problem lies. And to really get the most out of their guys. Let's use guys to their strengths. Use them to their strengths. Why did you bring them in? What did you draft them for? What did you sign them for? Well, use them for that and, and really get the most. Again, that's Keith Williams, T. Martin. They are huge in that. So, again, you're not having to scrap what you've done so far because it has gotten you a lot of success. It's gotten you this far. But now to get that much further, you need to really, again, diversify the passing game. But that's why I say I agree and disagree with this all at the same time. And then he, it fits, then he finishes and says the outcome of the decision could make or break the Ravens next few seasons. Now that, um, depending on how things go, and, and, but this is really every single year. Depending on how things go, there could be a lot of possible 
changes being made. I mean, teams go through a lot of changes regardless, but if there are more failures than successes, then teams, they go through a lot more changes um, when that is the case. So it's a wait and see. So was Bucky Brooks all wrong about the Ravens in his assessment of them? No, he wasn't. This time it wasn't a troll. Like when when he did that thing, oh the the Ravens they should uh they should have these two quarterbacks. They should have Lamar Jackson and Justin Fields, uh, so they don't have to pay Lamar Jackson because Justin Fields can come in and take over and, and he can carry this offense to where they need to go. It's plug and play. No, no, Bucky, it's not. That uh uh that was dead wrong. But this one, <laughs> this one he's actually not trolling. But anyway. Number three, the Indianapolis Colts. Perhaps a change of scenery and a familiar face, I mean, a familiar voice will help Wentz recapture the magic that made him an MVP frontrunner with the Eagles in 2017. Uh, the veteran quarterback steps into a Super Bowl-ready offense in Indianapolis with a beefy line and an underrated set of uh, perimeter playmakers, boasting big play potential. In addition, Wentz is supported by an elite defense that uh, stymies opponents in easy scoring chances with turnovers. If uh, Frank Rick, Rick, Rick Rich... Rick, whatever his name is, I forgot, who served as Wentz's offensive coordinator in Philly in 2016 and 17 can get the veteran quarterback to embrace his role as a game manager on a team that is built to make a run. The Colts could surge to the top of the AFC as the most complete squad in the league. Now, I do think there is some pressure on, on them as well, for sure, because they traded for Carson Wentz after Philip Rivers was like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm retired, I'm going to go ahead and call it quits. And I, I think that um, they could get better QB play out of uh, Wentz then Philip Rivers. And he gives you another element. Now, there's the injury history, which is a little bit scary, but he does give you another element in the running game because if all else fails, Philip Rivers ain't going nowhere. He'll catch you with some of them little troll runs, man, like Peyton Manning would do. It's like, it'll be so frustrating as a defense. You're like, okay, that quarterback, there's a statue back there, they ain't moving. If we got everything sold up in the past game, we, we got everything covered. No fly zone, baby. And then they take off. It's like, oh, you're so annoying. But Carson Wentz, he presents a legitimate threat on the ground. Uh, too. Um, but yeah, the Colts, they got a squad too. Man. They got, they, they, them boys got a squad, man. Offensive line, the run game, they, they're receivers. They brought T.Y. back, got Michael Pittman Jr. Um, uh, what's the guy's name with the, uh, I think, oh, I forgot his name. I can't think of his name right now. The other is Pascal, I think that's his name. But anyway, the boys got a little squad and they probably gonna get Zach Ertz too. I think they're gonna get Zach. Well, I'm recording this on June 28th. So if he is traded, after then and you don't see the video is this june 28th i think they're gonna get zachary's but anyway um there's a, so there's a, certainly some pressure um but again a, a, in the beginning of the article he said uh fair or not these tandems will face consequences if their teams fail to deliver when it matters um i mean where does it matter the, the think about this because and i know we've only gotten through uh the top three there's still two more but Think about when it matters. When, when does it matter the most? It matters the most in the playoffs. So if these teams fail to deliver in the playoffs, then, oh, it's going to be some crazy consequences. Well, yeah, they, they, will, they will have lost in the playoffs and not get to the Super Bowl. And that's every team's dream. But, again, I think it's just – I think that's just such a blanket statement. It's, it's all about the way that things go down. Because, say, for instance – if uh, using any of these teams, for example, and I can use, I just use the Ravens, for example, since we talk about the Ravens a lot. If the Ravens, say, say if they got to the playoffs, they got to the AFC champ, they got to whatever in the playoffs. And their offense scored 55 points. 55 points. They going crazy on offense. Like, let's go. That's what we've been waiting for. This receiver got 100 yards. This receiver got 70 yards. This receiver got 80 yards. This other receiver got 90 yards. The running backs got like 100 apiece. They going crazy. Lamar threw like four or five touchdowns. They're going wild. But the defense gives up 56 and they lose. Do you say, oh, that's okay. The offense, man, the offense wasn't good enough. We failed. Well, no, then it would go to the defense. And he'd be like, oh, man, the defense, they ain't hold it down. They gave up all those points. We scored all them points, but the defense gave up all those points. That's why I say it all just saying that these guys are under so much pressure. They do have some pressure, but it's all about the way that they respond to that pressure. It's all about the results. It's all about how things get done. Not just that things get done yes or no. It's not just so black and white. You got to see the way that things transpire and the way that things go down because that's just as important. Number four, 
said the Las Vegas Raiders, the duo is entering now and never territory into the fourth season of Gruden's rebuild. With the Raiders uh, sporting a 19-29 and record and zero playoff appearances since Gruden took over in 2018, the pressure is mounting on Carr and his coach to orchestrate a breakthrough in 2021. You know, I don't even want to read this whole thing. Um, I honestly, I just, I, I don't feel like there's much pressure on the Raiders and and Carr, uh, Derek Carr. Because I almost called him David, but that's a big bro. But I, I, I don't think there's any pressure on them because they've been together again. Uh, they've been together since 2018. The expectations are low. The expectations are low for the Raiders. So them, I honestly think them even making playoffs would be them exceeding expectations. What do people expect from them? Especially in a division at the end, but not even just their division, but based off of their play. What do people really expect from this Raiders team? You, and you got the Chiefs, you got the Chargers, and both of those teams are looking like they do. Obviously, the, the Chiefs, but the Chargers, they definitely on to come up. That boy Herbert is cold, man. And, and then you got the Broncos. They, well, they going through some things. But Raiders, they going through some things, too. So I, I just I don't think there's much pressure on these guys because... What, what, what if they don't make the playoffs? Then oh, what is Gruden gonna get fired? What pressure is there? Even in, I know he signed that ten-year contract a little while ago, but and 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 he could be released at any second from that. We know that just because somebody signs a ten-year contract, it doesn't mean they're gonna play out all ten years. We, it happens in the NFL all the time, every year. Guys sign these extensions and they don't make it through the extensions. But I don't feel like there's much pressure on them because the expectations are so low. Even if they don't do anything and Gruden gets fired or, or Carr gets traded or cut, okay, we all expected that. We all expected that. So I, I disagree with the pressure from there. All right, and then last he said the Chicago Bears. Let me read this one. If Nagy played for the Cubs or White Sox, he would step into the batter's box with two strikes on a quarterback on his quarterback scorecard following the failures of Mitch Trubisky and Nick Foles in the Windy City. Given another chance to fix the Bears quarterback woes with an ultra-talented prospect in his fourth season on a job, Nagy must plot out a course that will enable Fields to develop while the team makes a playoff run. Whether that plan features a wait-and-see approach with the first-round picks standing on the sidelines while Dalton serves as a veteran bridge, or a stage quarterback competition that enables the youngster to earn the job. Now, Nagy must ace this decision if he keeps the if he is to keep the franchise headed in the right direction. Otherwise, he could find himself standing in the unemployment line by the end of the season. Okay, with that one, I agree that um, there is certainly pressure on Nagy, but is this talked about QB coach duos? And I feel like if if there's if you're talking about a duo, if there's pressure on one, then there's pressure on another too. If the QB coach duo was Nagy and Dalton, even with Dalton, there's no pressure. He's on a, like, what, a one-year deal? He's a bridge quarterback for the Bears. He's not their future. This dude has absolutely no pressure on him whatsoever. The head coach does alone. I don't think there's any pressure on Dalton. I don't think there's any pressure on Fields, unless Fields were to take over from day one. Then there would be some pressure, at, but at the same time, it's the, the pressure is definitely on Nagy more than any. It's on a head coach more than any of these quarterbacks. But they've, been, they've continued to say Dalton is the starter. Dalton is the starter. Dalton is the starter. Okay, if Dalton is going to be the starter, like, it's, it's almost like he's saying, okay, yeah, we don't, we don't want to rush our young, young quarterback. Even though you know the fans, they're ready. They're ready for what's next. And Dalton is not who they want to see. He is not who they want to see. They're ready to see the next best thing. If it's Justin Fields, they're like, hey, we want to see what this guy's got, this young guy. So, again, pressure's not on Fields. Pressure's not on Dalton. Pressure's on the court, on, I mean, excuse me, on the coach all day. But as far as them, nah. They, pff, them boys ain't got nothing to worry about. And, again, Dalton just at this point in his career, and it's, it sounds sad, but it's true because it's the business. At this point in his career, just collecting checks. He's not, nobody's going to look at Andy Dalton like he's the future of their, team, of their team. Once Andy Dalton, once the Bengals said, all right, we're done, that was almost like the beginning of the end. Now it seems as he, he's going to be the next Ryan Fitzpatrick or something like that. To where he just goes to team to team to team just to sort of bridge the gap between their old quarterback and their new co young quarterback that they're bringing in. That's where Andy Dalton is right now at this point in his career. So as far as pressure, Nagy, yes, 
but their quarterbacks, no. But I did uh, enjoy this article, and I enjoyed this list. Because y'all know me, I, I, I hate making my own list, but when other people make the list, oh, yeah, y'all make lists all day. I read them, I, and I love them, and I appreciate them. So thank you, Bucky Brooks, for going through these different QB and coach duos and presenting to us why you feel like they're under pressure. I love y'all, team. Keep it clean. I appreciate y'all, and we out. That's my homie, ain't that right and graven? Right and graven. Shout out to Graven.